Some other pastors complained in 1967 about the head of Christ hanging in North Park's chapel. And they said, quote, it's a white Christ. It looks too Swedish. So already there's this tension of we don't really know what Christ looks like. And we're trying to decide, well, do, is he handsome or is he not? And others, they frowned upon any portrayal of Jesus. They're like, don't even draw him. Don't make a model of him. Just do nothing. Like, don't worry about it. Hi, my name is Danielle Romero, and I'm so glad you're here with me today on my channel where we've been delving into American history, American identity, and today we're going to tackle a big topic. When you imagine Jesus, what do you picture? Do you ever wonder why there are so many variations of the same person floating around in our collective imaginations? Most people, I think, picture painting by an artist named Warner Salmon. Painting of Christ uh, is actually called the Head of Christ, and it's a depiction of Jesus that basically is the most iconic, most famous depiction of the 20th century. And, you know, mentioning Jesus is kind of like throwing a spark on dry kindling. I had a few people ask me to do this video. I think s some folks might recoil at the topic. Um, because they can't stand the thought of talking about Jesus. And others who are deeply devoted are going to feel the same way because they're so concerned that maybe I'm treading on sacred ground and I shouldn't go there. But here's the thing. Um, what I try to do in a lot of my videos is stay as unbiased as possible, but we always have a bias. We always have something we're bringing. We always have a lens we're looking through when we're studying history. And it's, I think, important not to pretend that we don't have that bias, but to recognize what is the lens that you're looking through. And for me, I'm approaching this topic as a Christian. And so it's really interesting. It's been really interesting delving into this history of why do we picture Christ this certain way and how has that changed through time? And I've definitely thought about how Jesus has been portrayed historically um, the kinds of pictures you see in church, how they've changed over time, how they haven't changed over time, um, especially when it comes to his race or his ethnicity. And it's kind of wild when you think about it. Back in the Byzantine era, um, artists painted Jesus with darker skin, more in line with his Middle Eastern roots, which makes sense, right? But those Christianity spread across Europe, especially during the Renaissance in Italy. Jesus started to look pretty well, you know, European, um, with lighter hair, lighter skin, a lot of times blue eyes, you know, a totally different look. So why did that happen? Was it just artists painting what was familiar or was there something deeper going on? So it's uncomfortable to consider, I think for many Christians, um, but to some folks, they think that making Christ look European is a way to support some ugly ideas about colonialism and racism. But it's not just a European thing of, of creating a Christ in their own image, so to speak. So from the time of the ancient Romans, Christians have always contextualized Jesus in their own image. In Africa, in Ethiopia, for example, Jesus is often shown with African features and has been for some time. The same goes for Latin America, where you might see Christ with indigenous traits. Uh, it's like Jesus becomes this reflection of the people who look to him, which is Beautiful, but a bit complicated too. And this isn't just to, to argue over images, but it's about understanding our faith and maybe our shared human experience a little bit better. That's really the whole point of my channel. So let's go back to this iconic image, the head of Christ. This is a single painting so iconic that its image graces everything from hymnals to nightlights. Uh, that's the power of Warner Solomon's head of Christ from 1940. Light-haired, light-eyed, strikingly Caucasian, this rendition of Jesus has become the face of Christian houses globally. But where did this picture come from? Well, before we delve into that story, which is fascinating, it's important to note that today I have the luxury of sitting here with you and we can debate the racial undertones of how Christ is portrayed in art. But the earliest followers of Christ navigated a theological minefield over whether or not he should be depicted at all. So there's this issue of the first commandment. In first century AD, there was a proscription against graven images. It's taken seriously. So this meant that during Jesus's lifetime and the ensuing decades, Jewish communities in Judea and Galilee produced no figure art of Christ. There were no portraits painted of him. And so only by the third century did attitudes begin to change 
And this was evident in Jewish figure art, like the frescoes and some of the Duro Europus synagogues, and you start seeing these pictures emerge. Now, the theological implications of Jesus' appearance have been a topic of debate among Christians and non-Christians for centuries, and <laughs> there are some funny dialogues about this. So initially, Jesus was represented by a pictogram symbol, like the ichthys, which is the fish. Sometimes you see that on people's cars. There were some other symbolic, you know, things that were used to represent him to avoid creating an image of him. But let's go back even further. Well, did the Bible describe what Jesus looked like? Well, yes and no. And there's been definitely some misinterpretations, misapplications of what it said. So some early Christians envisioned Jesus with these stunning figures of youthful classical hero. And we're thinking like these Greek gods, classical heroes. But church fathers like Justin and Tertullian argued in alignment with Isaiah 53 too, that Christ's appearance was unremarkable, that, quote, he had no form that we should look upon him, nor beauty that we should delight in him. Well, then a pagan named Celsus <laughs> mocked Christianity, and this was around the year 180, and they mocked, he mocked Christians because he said we had an ugly God, and the apologist Origen fired back, and he referenced Psalm 45, 3, which said, quote, gird thy sword upon thy thigh, mighty one, with thy beauty and fairness. So there's a verse that I have seen come up a lot when people are, are trying to, you know, defend their belief about how Christ looked. And it's from in the first chapter of the book of Revelations, the last book of the Bible. And verse 15, it says, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace or or you could say burnished bronze, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And some people will point to this and say, well, bronze is a dark metal. This means that Jesus has or had dark skin, but I didn't understand burnished. I wasn't sure what that meant. So I kind of went on a little bit of a, a rabbit hole researching um, people that work with precious metals, what that process looks like. And so burnished bronze, it looks nothing like regular bronze. Burnished bronze is a, a for lack of a better word, I mean, it, it's literally just glowing, a glowing orangey yellow color and certainly not a shade of skin that I've ever seen before. As far as this passage of scripture is concerned, it's not pointing at Christ and saying he had dark skin like bronze, but it's this sense of um, Christ in his heavenly body and just a sense of, of lightness and just otherworldliness about him. And so it was kind of a lesson for me of just not taking things at face value because I would have read that and thought bronze is dark. That's what that's what it was referring to. And he, he may have dark skin, but that's not what that passage is saying about him. And so over time, these perspectives were shifting. Jerome and Augustine of Hippo, who as a side note, he was born in Africa um, in a Roman province there. Uh, they contended that Jesus must have embodied this ideal beauty. Augustine notably described Christ as, quote, a beautiful child, beautiful on earth, and beautiful in heaven. So already there's this tension of we don't really know what Christ looks like, and we're trying to decide, well, do, is he handsome or is he not? But as Christianity was still finding its feet under the Roman Empire, the art was deliberately ambiguous. So remember, the early church had significant Jewish membership at the beginning. And these followers were caught between their inherited hostility towards idols and the surrounding pagan world filled with intricate depictions of gods all around them. And early Christian thinkers uh, like Clement of Alexandria and others, they frowned upon any portrayal of Jesus. They're like, don't even draw him, don't make a model of him, just do nothing. Like, don't worry about it. In fact, the 36th canon of the Synod of Elvira in 36 AD decreed that no pictures should be in church. They were just like shutting it down, like do not put any pictures of Christ in church. So that's bringing us all the way to 300 AD. So the question of Jesus's depiction would spark debate until the end of the fourth century. So just, this is just to lay the foundational understanding that any pictures we're looking at of Christ, paintings, not pictures, they're not coming until after 300 AD. I mean, that's a pretty decent chunk of time um, you know, between people who would have seen Christ and the stories that were passed down. So the first flickers of Christian art and the earliest surviving Christian art that people have come across come from the late second to early fourth centuries. It's kind of somewhere in there. And primarily these were found in tombs of wealthy Christians in the catacombs of Rome. 
oldest known portrait of Jesus that I have found to be substantiated was found in Syria, uh, dated around 235 AD. So beginning in the mid fourth century, after the Edict of Milan in 313 legalized Christianity and the faith, you know, had the favor of the empire behind it, depictions of Christ start coming out. But they're coming out in the sense of Christ the King eventually giving rise to these forms of Christ the majesty. So there's this very, there's a sense of this royalty about Christ in these early images. Now, some scholars dispute the idea that the shift in representation was influenced by political events, but you know how scholars are, they will argue about something forever. If you fast forward to the seventh century, you'll find that there's legendary tales begin to fill in the gaps uh, that are left by historical ambiguity. Now, these stories essentially standardized an image of Jesus as a bearded man with shoulder length dark hair. Now this trend continues on into the Renaissance where artists begin to interpret Jesus in their own likeness. So we have artists who went as far as incorporating their own features into images of Jesus, kind of blurring the lines between divine and mortal. This wasn't just a case though of artistic license, it was reflecting this emerging cultural and social bias of the time. But not all artists whitewashed Jesus, so to speak. Notable exceptions include Rembrandt, who used a man from Amsterdam's Jewish district as his model for Christ. Um, there was another French artist who during the 1930s emphasized Jesus's Jewishness in his art as a battle against the anti-Semitism of the time. And I, I don't know if you saw what, I think it was in 2001, um, where scientists came in and said, we'll tell you what he looked like. Uh, and there was a TV series in 2001 called The Son of God or something like that, and they went forensic. So they used a first century Jewish skull from Israel, like at the time, and they had a medical artist reconstruct the face, and it definitely didn't look like the Renaissance interpretations of Jesus. Um, a New Testament scholar chimed in with details about skin color and hair color based on third century images from the synagogue and earliest known pictures of Jewish people at the time. The consensus that Christ likely had a broader face, a larger nose, and an olive skin tone. So the very act of visualizing Christ has as long as people have been doing it, had a flavor of the community that the people are coming from. And when I'm looking at these, these beautiful images from Korean artists and African artists and Haitian artists and Chinese artists and people from the Bronx and all, all of these people who are imagining Christ well, none of, none of these Christs look like each other for the most part. Uh, it's just interesting to be looking at these pictures and seeing these cultural hints of the person who is painting it. There's one Korean artist in particular, I just want to share a little bit of his story and I'll put his work up on the screen. He wrote an essay in 1984, his uh, name is Kim, and he said he started creating these paintings based on the life of Christ in 1952. And he created these paintings while taking refuge at his mother-in-law's house during the Korean War. Following the suggestion from a missionary, he started painting Christ's life, quote, during a time of agony suffered by Koreans because of war. I was praying for the quick end of the Korean War and a unified peace, and it soothed my painful mind with a paintbrush. And to me, as I, I know that some people are gonna say, hey, that's not how Christ looked. He wasn't wearing this traditional Korean outfit or what have you, but, but what's happening here is I don't think people are trying to make a statement to say definitively, this is what Christ looks like. This is not a historic depiction of him, which nobody has, despite what people may claim. Nobody has that, and I, I think probably for good reason. But, but this idea of the interaction with even the image of Christ is something that is, brings comfort to people. Let's go back now to this iconic image of Christ, the head of Christ, with all the debate that has kind of surrounded this in recent years. I saw a really interesting quote that came out of a book about this I can link to below, but basically some other pastors complained in 1967 about the head of Christ hanging in North Park's chapel. And they said, quote, it's a white Christ. It looks too Swedish. So I think it's interesting, Warner Salman's image it's not probably historically accurate, especially based on the context clues of how and when it was created. Because what you'll find is that the artist Warner Salmon was doing what all of these other artists were doing. And what they were doing was creating an image of Christ 
that felt like home to them. This now iconic image actually had very humble beginnings. It was a charcoal sketch for the first issue of something called Covenant Companion, which was a youth magazine belonging to what was then known as the Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant. So Solomon, who was raised in this religious community, it's now called the Evangelical Covenant Church. He was a commercial artist based in Chicago. And his aim with this picture was for him to make Jesus relatable to a young modern audience. Well, who was his audience that he was painting and drawing for? It was a Swedish Christian audience. So according to a gallery director um, at Indiana's Anderson University, that I think they house a lot of these pictures uh, since the 1980s, Solomon's Jesus had this vibe of kind of like a professional photograph of the era. Um, which was intended to make the divine feel accessible. It kind of felt like a lot of the kinds of school pictures and things like that that you might get at that time. Warner Solomon's portrayal of Christ is not a lot of the things I think it gets accused of being, of being a tool of white supremacy or being a tool to suppress, you know, people of other color or their experiences or interactions with Christ. I think what Warner Solomon had was what all these other artists had, and it was his interaction with the art as a medium of, of connecting with Christ and, and whatever that meant to them. And it's interesting though, because that doesn't mean that his intent is how it was ultimately used, but the painting itself, the drawing itself, is you know, no more a representation of Christ than, than the Korean one or the Chinese one and the Cameroon one, but it still has value. You know, the, the familiarity um, naturally informs artistic vision for a lot of people. Um, and I think that you can see how Salman would have created the, the Christ that he created based on his community experience, just like so many of these depictions of Christ reflect that community experience. And the subconscious projection of one's ethnic trait or conscious choice to do that um, is not unique to Salman or this drawing and throughout history, as I've shown, communities throughout the world have depicted holy figures in ways that reflect their own appearances, creating a sense of like closeness and relatability. And I think furthermore, during Solomon's time, and we were talking the 1940s, there was definitely less emphasis here in the United States on historical accuracy in religious art. Um, the primary goal was to you know, inspire faith or devotion or, or however they were perceiving that rather than providing an accurate representation of maybe Middle Eastern features, so to speak. And I, I was researching this and I saw that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. commented on Christ's appearance. I wanted to share this quote with you. And he was a Protestant pastor and he wrote in the Ebony magazine. He had a column. It's really interesting. Um, I can link to it below, um, but I, this was from 1957. And he said that, quote, the color of Jesus's skin is of little or no consequence. The significance of Jesus lay not in his color, but in his willingness to surrender his will to God's will. He would have been no more significant if his skin had been black. He is no less significant because his skin was white, um, which we obviously, we don't know exactly what tone Jesus's skin was, but I, I really appreciated the way Dr. King worded this. Um, that it really shouldn't be a focus on the skin. That's the wrong focus. Like I said before, I'm a Christian and I've had to think about what these different portrayals mean. And I do think about them. And I, I don't mean to be trite when I say, you know, well, it's just a representative of that community and, and that's all because um, these representations are powerful. What I, love, what, what I love about what Dr. King said is that it's not just about the color of Christ's skin or how artists imagine him, but it's deeper. It's about this message of his love and how that cuts across every human division. And we are so divided. We are so divided that, you know, even arguing over, over Christ's skin, is it, is it dark enough? Is it, is it light enough? It's too much this, it's too much that, that the message gets lost in that. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, whether you're a Christian or not, I think it's, it's, this is a community conversation and I think it's an overdue conversation. Um, you know, a lot of things on my channel, I'm talking about American identity. I'm talking about these topics of race and ethnicity, but it's, it's not t because I'm a race baiter. It's not because I want to create division. It's, it's because of the opposite that, 
we have just become so accustomed to the way race is talked about, the way ethnicities are talked about. We just accept that there are these groups who are permanently at war with each other. And I think that delving into our history, we will see that we are so much more connected than we realize. And I think, I think that that is incredibly obvious in this discussion of what Christ really looked like. And you see all these different cultures from around the world historically creating Christ that reflects their community. And it's not out of aggression towards other communities, but it's in response to wanting to be connected to something greater. So thank you so much for being here and we'll talk soon.